So yeah, so the point of, as I, yeah, uh, the goal of these lectures is really to try to, to explain what are the good constructions of these kind of magical codes that were formed like in the last two years. So yesterday I was reviewing the classical case because it's like a good starting point. So let me recap quickly what I did yesterday. So mainly the idea of yesterday was to give like a kind of a recipe to, to, to construct good LDPC codes. And what is the, this recipe? So it's called the Tanner code construction. It's in a classical case. So the idea is to build a code is you need two ingredients. You need uh, a graph, a large graph. Uh, and you need some small codes. Uh, and when you do that, what you get is a large code. Uh, so, okay, so let me give you two examples. Um, maybe. Uh, so one example is the repetition code. Okay, so the repetition code, you can do it like this. So the graph in that case will be just a cycle. Uh, so you draw a cycle with n vertices or n edges. Uh, so I recall, so you put the, the bits of your codes on the edges, and, and you need to put constraints on the vertices. So for the repetition code, the small code that you take is just a repetition code. You know, every vertex touches two edges, so you need a code of length two, and you take the, basically the only code of length two, it's a repetition code also. also. So this C0 is just a code with two code words, 0, 0, and 1, 1. Okay, and now you have a code word x, so x1, x2, x3, xn. Okay, so it's a code word of length n. It will be a code word if, you know, at every vertex, uh, if you just look at the two coordinates that you have, x2, x3, it should belong to this small code. Okay, so it just means that x2, x3 should be either 0, 0, or 1, 1. Okay, and you see that all the coordinates, all the bits have to be the same because at every vertex, you have this condition. Okay, and when you do that, you get the repetition code. Um, so it's a code, the classical code. You have n bits. Um, you have one logical bit, and the distance is n. Okay? So you have only two code words, 0, 0, 0, and n, 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 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? Yes? Sorry? It is an example of Italian code construction. So you have a graph, you have your bits on the edges, and on every vertex, you have some constraints. You, the constraints are that if you just look at the sub, sub word, the word, uh, the sub vector x2, x3, it should belong to this code. Okay, so it's. Yesterday it was the same, no? Yesterday I had this graph. It was, I was taking a bipartite graph. Um, it doesn't have to be bipartite. This one, you can make it bipartite if it's even, even length. Uh, and I was asking that on every vertex, if you look at the edges uh, incident to that vertex, you belong to some code word, to some small code. And here, the small code is just this very simple one, 0, 0, 1, 1. No, no, so you have constraints on vertices on the left and on the right. Everywhere. Okay, so that's the kind of the simplest thing you can do. And then, so this was one, one construction. Um, and a slightly more advanced one was to not take a graph like this, but you take what I call an expander graph. Uh, it was parameterized by some parameter lambda, which is, you know, the expansion coefficient, if you want. Um, and these kind of graphs, they are sparse graphs with good randomness properties. Um, so I, don't need, I won't give you a, like an explicit example of these things, but we can construct those things. Um, and then if you do that on a large graph and you do the same recipe, but now you have like a small code. Um, so if this is a delta regular graph, so meaning that every vertex is incident to delta edges, then on every vertex you can put you know, constraints corresponding to a code a small code of length delta. You take this, you take a small code of length delta with some uh, number of logical bits, rho times delta and some distance. 
delta times delta. And if you do that, if you, and if the expansion coefficient is basically smaller than this uh, small delta, then what you get, so it's called the expander code. This is due to Tipser and Spinman in 96. Uh, and these are good LDPC codes. So you have codes of length n, um, you have order n logical bits, and distance, which is also order n. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. So I would say, like, for communication, if you don't need the, the distance property, if you just care about, you know, being able to decode efficiently, and uh, if you want, uh, you know, to be robust against er random errors, not adversarial errors, I think people use random constructions. I mean, random constructions are fine if you, if n is large enough. If you want like a smaller value of n. And then you need to add some structure, okay? Because the kind of the effects of randomness they kick in once n is large enough. So then you can you, you need some structure, and maybe in that case, exponent codes can be useful. But they are useful like in TCS, in theoretical computer science, because then you have very good properties. <coughs> okay, so that's the classical picture. Okay, so what I wanted to emphasize yesterday is really this construction, this tenor code construction, where you have a graph. It can be a very simple graph like this, or it can be a more complicated graph like that. And then you put simple constraints on every vertex, and then you get a code. Okay? Um, and what I would like to do now is to do kind of the same thing in the quantum case. Okay? That could be the, um, that, that's the hope. Okay? That in the quantum case, you can also design quantum codes with this kind of recipe. Um, turns out that you can't. Okay? You, you need to change something. Um, so what you can do here, so, but, but it, will be, it will be close enough. So basically, we need to replace the graph um, by something a bit more complicated, and, but we will find such an object. Um, and we will also have small codes that will be product codes. So that's why I introduced them yesterday as well. Uh, and then if you do that, you will get quantum, good quantum codes. Um, Or do you decode what? The classical one or the quantum one? Um, so, uh, yeah, the plan is not to talk too much about decoding. Um, <laughs> the house part, right? Sorry? The house part, right? This is, yeah, in general, this can be the hard part. For this, uh, for this exposure code, it's not, it's not very hard, uh, it turns out. So, yeah, you can use belief propagation for any LDPC. Um, for this also, yes, you can do that. Yeah. But I will not talk about decoding because this would get us too far. Um, okay, so let me just give you a taste of what we will need in a quantum case and what we will do, and then I will I will look at a simple example of the of the surface code this morning and this afternoon. I will try to do like uh, the version of uh, corresponding to good quantum elliptical. So basically, what I want to do in a quantum case is kind of the generalization of this one, it will be the surface code, and the generalization of that one this afternoon, it will be the good quantum LDPC codes that we have now. Um, so when we want to generalize, we need, we need to, you know, change this, this framework a little bit. Um, so why is that? Um, so we'll come back to that in a few minutes, but, but the main idea is that in the quantum ca case, you know, you need, when you define the quantum code, you need, um, as Robert mentioned, and also uh, Victor, yes, uh, Days ago, you need generators. So you need uh, a bunch of poly operators that will stabilize your code. Um, and you need these, these generators to commute pairwise. Okay, and these commutation uh, constraints that you have, uh, they are not quite compatible with a graph like this. Okay, because, you know, if you, if you put, so you, ideally what you would like to do is to mimic this thing. So you would like to have qubits corresponding to edges and then constraints on the vertices. So the constraints could be, you know, X-type constraints, so product of poly X operators, or product of poly Z operators. But what you need is that they commute. But now you see, if you have an X-type constraint here and a Z-type constraint there, uh, well, they will meet on one qubit only. So they will never commute. 
So on a graph like this, you, you cannot really, it's not really compatible with commutation relation. So you need something else than a graph. So what you need um, is a generalization of a graph um, uh, in the following sense. So a graph is what? A graph is a bunch of vertices, so objects of dimension zero, and a bunch of edges, so objects of dimension one. So what we will need in cotton case is a generalization. So we'll need an object, combinatorial object, with vertices, edges, and objects of dimension two. Okay? In our case, it will be squares. Okay, so we'll, what we'll use is a, what is called a square complex. Um, so it's really a generalization of a graph where you have vertices, um, edges, and squares. Um, and for instance, for the toric code, I will mention that, basically what you need is, you know, you have a torus, so you identify, you know, um, and this thing with this thing, and this one with that one, so you have really the topology of a torus, and then you put a grid on a torus. Okay, so you've seen that. We will detail that in a few minutes. So you have really, you know, vertices, edges, and squares. Um, and then, you know, then you need, so this would be the, the thing that replaces the graph, and then you need some codes. Um, uh, some classical code, yeah, codes um, to enforce some, you know, constraints on the qubits. Um, and the codes, in our case, they will be really product codes. So C0 times C1. Um, so I remind you that a product code, you know, uh, you can view a code word as a matrix. Uh, and basically what you ask is that every column of this matrix belongs to the code C0, and every row of the matrix belongs to C1. So for the, rep, for the surface code, this thing that we will take, C0 and C1, they will be just this guy. Okay, they will both be equal, equal to this thing. And so the product code for this thing, uh, it only contains um, two words, two code words. One is zero, 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 zero. So four zeros, and the other one is one, 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 one. Okay, so I will explain that. Uh, I will make a picture. And if you do that, what you get is a surface code. Or the toric code, the same for me. Um, so when you, I will explain this. I will just so this will be the purpose of this uh, of this morning. I will explain this in more details. Uh, so what you get is that you have a thing with n qubits. You have one or two cube logical qubits. So if you take like a toric topology, you get two logical qubits and you get distance square root n. So so the way I will when you when I define the toric code like this, it's a slightly different version from the one that we've seen in Robert's talk. So there are kind of different versions of the toric code, um, but this one is really the one uh, that completely fits into this framework. Uh, and then the goal of this afternoon uh, will be to say, okay, uh, exactly as in a classical case. In a classical case, we start with this very simple example where you have a cycle and the very simple, the simplest code that you can think of at each vertex. So here it's the same. We have the simplest square complex that we can think of. We have the simplest code that we can enforce at each, at each vertex. Um, and then in the classical case, we say, OK, let's take a better graph. Let's take an expander graph. And let's take better local codes. In the quantum case, it turns out that you can do the same. So you can take a better square complex. Um, and you can take you know, better product codes, like a bit longer than uh, size 2. And what you will get is good quantum elliptic code. Okay, so it's very, the main, you know, construction idea is kind of simple. It's not that complicated, I think. Um, okay, so is it fine with everyone? Okay, so the goal of this morning is really to, to explain more the, the surface code or the toric code uh, in this language. Okay, so let me do that. Because, you know, so the standard way of presenting the, the toric code is to do this kind of, same kind of picture I did. Um, okay, let's see. So now I want to do the toric code. Um, so I have a torus, so I imagine that this is a torus, so I identify 
this, uh, this uh, left edge with this right edge and the bottom and top edges. And okay, I, so I put a grid on this thing. Okay. And so usually the way it's presented, um, you, you know, you, you say, okay, I put the qubits on the edges of this torus, I put um, constraints on the, uh, on the plaquettes and on the vertices. So I will do this, something different here. Um, so before I do that, is it useful that I, I, I explain again what is a quantum code? Because I didn't do that. Yes. Yeah, okay, so, okay, let me try to do that. A bit too fast. Um, okay, so what is a quantum code? Uh, so I will not define a quantum code in general. I will look at a specific class of quantum codes called stabilizer codes. Uh, so the code is just a subspace, you know, uh, of your, so you have n physical qubits and you want a subspace of this space of n physical qubits. And you, the way you define a subspace is by, you know, imposing some constraints on the states that, uh, that, that we live in this thing. Okay, so you take the state of n qubits Um, and now we want to, you know, enforce some constraints. So in the classical case, it was really linear constraints. You know, you have these binary equations that I had yesterday. In the quantum case, uh, what I want is kind of the same. So um, I will look at the class of codes called, called CSS codes. So in that case, uh, you have only two types of constraints. You have X-type constraints and Z-type constraints. You have X-type constraints uh, that are defined by some poly X operators, G, I, X. Okay, so I will have poly operators, so products of poly X. Um, and you ask that this sta this, this, the state is stabilized by this operator. So you, you ask that if you apply this poly operator to this thing, you get psi for all of these G, I, X operators, and you have a second type of operators that will be poly Z operators, G, J, like Z, Psi, we call Psi, for all G, J, Z. Uh, so let me take you, let me take an example. You could have like, I don't know, G1, X is maybe, you know, X on the first qubit, uh, X also on the second qubit, Identity on the third one, uh, I don't know, uh, X on the fourth, and then identity everywhere else. Um, and I take maybe G1, Z. So this would be, I don't know, identity on the first qubit, X, sorry, Z on the second qubit, identity, and Z on the first qubit, and then identity. Um, so these are, this is a possibility. So. So what matters for this thing is that, you know, so this code, this code space is basically the, the plus one eigenspace, common eigenspace of all these operators. Yes. So these are uh, separate right? Yes. Can you, can you define a general quantum code that does not uh, work with the framework of the other You can do that, yes. So this is not the most general. This is not the most general version. It's just a stabilizer version, and even the CSS version. So CSS means that all the, all the generators, they are either of type X, so products of X and identity, or type Z, so product of I and identity, identity and Z. But in general, you could have X, Y, Z everywhere. And... Okay, so, so this thing will be the common eigenspace of these operators, and so if we want this common eigenspace to be well-defined, what we want is that all these operators, they should commute. Um, and this is the tricky part in the quantum case. So we, you, we want to find these things to be commuting operators. And so that's one part. The other thing that we need, if we want the, Q, the LDPC condition, um, we want all the GIs to be sparse. So we want them to act you know, non-trivially on a constant number of qubits each. So for the Toric code, it will be four. 
So each of the GI will act non-trivially on only four qubits. Okay, so in general, we want sparse constraints. We want, you know, uh, we don't want these operators to act on like n over two qubits. Um, so the, really, the, the challenge in the quantum case is to find these kind of sparse operators that commute pairwise. Okay. <clears throat> So how do I do that? Um, so usually I don't want to, to work with this representation. I don't want to bother with X operators, Z operators, uh, poly operators. Uh, because, you know, you have only two types of constraints and they're either of X type or Z type. Uh, there's a simpler representation for these guys. And the representation is to write these things, you know, as bit strings. So I will put a zero whenever I have the identity and I will put a one whenever I have an X operator. So this GIX, I can represent it by the string one, one, zero, one, and then whatever. This thing, I can also represent it by uh, zero, one, one, sorry, zero, thanks. Okay, I need to, to keep in mind that these are like X type and these are Z type. But once I do that, if I give you the zeros and the ones, I know, I know how to reconstruct this thing. Um, and now what I can do is I can somehow put all these things in some matrices. So I can define two classical parity check matrices, like yesterday, binary ones. Uh, so for H X, I will put all the GIs, the GI X. So I will put one, one, zero, one, blah, blah. And whatever, all the, the, the GIX in the, the first matrix. And, and then for the second kind of operators, I can define HZ, the second parity check matrix, uh, that will also contain these guys. So 0, 1, 0, 1, and, and the rest. OK, so, so my quantum code is really given by these two matrices. Once I give you HX and HZ, I can reconstruct all these uh, poly operators, and then I can get my code. Okay, and now what is interesting is that, uh, so two things. So the LDPC condition just means that these two matrices are sparse, just like yesterday. This should be sparse matrices. Uh, but now you have a second condition, which is this commutativity con constraint. So I need these guys and these guys to, to commute. Uh, so what does that mean? So for two operators to commute, it means that, you know, uh, so on each qubit, they can either commute, if there's an X and an identity, but whenever there's an X and a Z, they anti-commute. So what you need for these two operators to commute globally is that they should anti-commute on an even number of, of, of positions. Um, and basically what this means is that these two-bit strings, they should be orthogonal. If you take their dot product, it should be zero. So if you take the dot product of these two things, mod two over F2, yeah. So so you know you get a one on the second on the second qubit and a one on the first qubit. So what you need is that these two matrices, if you take any row in the first one and any row in the second one, these two things should be orthogonal. Okay, and this is the same as saying that if you take if you take H X and you multiply by by H Z transpose. Okay, this is exactly what you are doing when you take the dot product of every rows, and this should be zero, but two. Okay, so quantum code, quantum CSS code is really what you get when you, when you give me, you know, two matrices, HX and HZ, that satisfy this condition. Um, <clears throat> and it will be LDPC if in addition, you know, these matrices are sparse. Um, so, okay, it looks simple enough. Uh, turns out it's not so simple. You see, I mean, yesterday I gave you like a recipe to get good, good classical LDPC codes. So, a good code means, so, okay, or said otherwise, you know, the classical code that, that if you just look at HX, you can define a classical code, okay, which is the, the kernel of this thing. All the, all the vectors X, which are orthogonal to all these guys. Okay, this is a classical code. But this is a classical code that we had yesterday. So the kernel of HX is a classical code. Uh, what is this? So here, basically, I define two classical codes. No? I define 
Tx, which is the kernel of Hx. So all the vectors of length n, which are orthogonal to all these, all these, uh, all these guys. Uh, so this is an LDPC code, if this, uh, this matrix is sparse. Uh, is it good? Is it a good code in the sense of yesterday? In the sense that, it, does it have like a, a minimum distance that scales linearly with n? So we could expect that maybe we want to do that. Turns out we cannot do that. And we know it's not the case because we want, we want these guys to, to belong to this code. You know? the fa when you say that the first row here is orthogonal to all these rows, it really means that this first vector that you have here, uh, it belongs to that code. Okay? It's, in, it's in the kernel of this thing. But this first vector, because hz is sparse, this is what you want, its weight is constant. That's constant weight. So it means that this, this code contains vectors of constant weight. So it's not a good code in the sense that the, the, the distance is not linear in n. It's constant distance. Um, so, the, the, you know, so the space uh, that is you know, spanned by these rows, uh, so the, if you want the image of uh, hz, or maybe hz transpose, so the, the, the space spanned by these things, uh, this is what is denoted usually cz perp. So, so cz is just the kernel of hz, and cz perp is all the vectors which are orthogonal to all the, all the, all the code words of, uh, of cz. Um, so, you know, any, because, you know, any code word in cz has to be orthogonal to every of these guy. And so each of these guy has to be orthogonal to every code word in, in CZ. Um, so basically what this condition tells you, this commutativity tells you, is that this, this space, CZ perp, it's included in CX. Okay, so CZ perp is just the, the thing spanned by the, the rows of H, HZ. Um, Okay, so you have a code, classical code, that contains many, like a, a linear subspace uh, that is spanned by vectors of, of very low weight. Um, so what is the distance of the quantum code? So how many errors? Again, why, why they have low weight? Why? So low weight comes from the sparse condition. So I want, so I want to, I'm studying quantum LDPC okay, codes. So these right. things, things are LDPC. Yes. Say that again. The, the vector, the row vectors of HZ, then be the basis of HZ. It's the same dimension. Uh, it's not the same dimension. So it's included. So you think that this should, these two objects should be equal? This is, yeah. So in general, so it could be. Uh, but what we want is that these two things are not equal. We want we want somehow that there are things in this in this space which are not in that space. Uh, and this will be where the, the quantum information is encoded. Do you know that the, the dagger is included in the CX and not the other way around? So we have this, and we also have CX perp, which is included in CZ. Um, so CX perp just mean, you know, or CZ perp just means you know the, the things that correspond to to sums of of rows in that thing. So this thing has to be in the kernel of HX by definition. Uh, but now you could have things which are in the kernel of this that are not written uh, as element of that, of that thing. So one example for, if you know already the, the, the toric code, uh, in the toric code, uh, uh, so CX will be, you know, the space of uh, all cycles um, uh, on your on your grid, so this would be like an element of CX, uh, and this would also be like an element of CX. You do, do a cycle around the thing. Uh, so this would be CX, and CZ perp would be all the loops. Uh, no, sorry, all the, all the boundaries. So all the things that you get when you take a, a set of plaquettes and you, you draw the boundary. So this thing is also a boundary. This thing is the boundary of this guy. So this thing belongs to CZ perp. But this one is not a boundary of anyone. 
Okay, there's no one that has this boundary. So this guy is in Cx, but not in Cz part. Okay, so this belongs to Cx, but not in Cz part. This is in Cz perp and in Cx. Um, and then if you want to understand, so the, the code space will really be given by these guys. So this will be the code space. The, the guys uh, who belong to Cx, but not to Cz perp. Um, and now if you want to understand how many errors this kind of codes um, can correct, uh, it, re it will really be about the weight of these guys. Okay, so, so this guy, if you have this type of error, uh, then this error will commute with all your generators. You won't notice it. So the, 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 com the computer will not notice that you had this error. But this thing, because it belongs to the image of that, it's, a, it's itself in the stabilizer group. And because it's in the stabilizer group, it acts trivially on all the code words. So this thing, this operator, if you put an operator here, if you act with this operator on any psi, which is in your code, it will leave psi invariant. Okay, so this is an error, but that does not do anything to your quota information. So you don't care about that. The only errors that you care about, they are the errors which are not in CZ perp. So these are the errors like this. So this is a problematic error that will act non-trivially in your code space so that it will do something, but you will not notice it. So when you define the distance of the quantum code, um, um, it's really the distance you have. So you have two distances, one for you know, bit flips and one for phase flips. So you can define dx, uh, which is one of the two distances. So it will be the minimum weight um, of an error of, you know, a poly operator, uh, such that this poly operator, or, you know, uh, or let's call it x, x uh, belongs to, as I wrote there, cx, but not to cz perp. Okay? So this is because these are the guys which give you, like, problematic errors. And you, you have the other one for the other type of Error, so you have bit flips and face flips, um, but it's a symmetric one. So it's the minimum weight of a, a word that belongs to CZ, but not to CX. Top. Okay, and the distance of the quantum code is the minimum of these two things. So it's, it's kind of, it's really different from the classical case. So you, you again, you look for like problematic errors, but it, in the quantum case, you have many errors that exist, but that don't do anything to your information, so you don't care about those. And it's good, because these ones, they have, they have constant weight. They can have constant weight. Um, and now the goal is to, you know, find a quantum code where, you know, these matrices are sparse, uh, and where the, the distance is large. So the, the weight of this guy is large. So for the toric code, you know, uh, Kind of the smallest errors in this in this thing, they really have to go through the torus, okay, around the torus. So typically they have weight square root n. So if you have n, you know, if you have n qubits uh, to go around the torus, it's square root n. It was a, like a really big question whether you could do better than square root n. Uh, okay, so that's the recap of general um, stabilizer codes or CSS codes. And okay, so now let's look back. At the, the sorry, the ah yeah the rate so yeah it's a good so the rate so I need to define the dimension of the code it's a good point so uh, so what's the dimension of the code is basically so you have how many qubits are encoded uh, so in total you have n qubits n physical qubits and basically each of these row if they are independent they remove you know, one qubit. Each constraint removes one qubit. So the, the number of logical qubits is n minus the rank of hx minus the rank of hz. Okay, so the rank of hx just counts so many, like, independent equations you have of type x, and the, the rank of hz counts so many equations you have of type z. So each equation is like a parity check equation. It gives you one constraint, so, you know, you have a set of this number of equations, you have this number of variables, so the number of 
uh, solutions that you have is basically the difference between these two things. Okay? So for the toric code, uh, you will get okay, n. So, uh, so for the toric code, you get n. Here you have uh, n minus 1 independent over 2 uh, independent, uh, independent relations for hx, and the same for hz. Um, maybe it's n over 2 minus 1. Uh, so you get two, but, uh, but in general, so in general, you want to get much bigger than two. You want something linear in n. That we get something linear in n. Yes. Well, by by choosing better codes than this thing. <laughs> um, okay. So. So yeah. So in the last five minutes, let me let me explain the, the toric code or the surface code um, in the language I want to talk about uh, in this Taylor code construction language that I was mentioning. Um, so I don't want to do what I just drew there. I don't want to say, okay, the, the standard thing, that the qubits are the edges and that the, the you know, uh, the, some generators are the plaquettes and some generators are the uh, or the vertices. I want to do something slightly different. Um, so let me draw again my. Um, so what I want to do is really to use the same, you know, thing as I was mentioning before. So I want. I have this grid. I have this. This thing that will generalize my graph, it will, it will be like a, an object with vertices, edges, and squares. Okay, and I will want to put the qubits on the squares and the constraints on the vertices. Um, so to do that, I need uh, two types of vertices. Uh, let me. So there will be the, the blue or the marked vertices and the ones that are not marked. Okay, so what I, I will do, so I, I put the qubits, each qubit will be on a square. Okay, so the qubits, they correspond to the squares. Um, and I need to define two two sets of generators, okay? So I will define generators on the vertices. So the blue vertices, there will be one type of generators, and then the unmarked vertices, it will be the other type of generators. Uh, so say, I don't know, X generators, they will be on the blue vertices, and the Z generators, they will be on the other ones, the red. <coughs> okay, so, at each, at each vertex, I will impose some, some constraint. Okay, and what will be the constraint? So the constraint I want to use uh, is really the ones that I was mentioning before. So I want to use this standard code idea of putting a small code on every, um, on every vertex. Uh, and the small code I want to use um, is this product code C0 times C0. So as I, I was mentioning that before, so this thing uh, will contain two code words, either 0, 0, 0, 0, written as a matrix in matrix form, or 1, 1, 1, 1. Um, and because, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0 is kind of useless, so only the 1, 1, 1, 1 matters for me. And the, so the, the GIs, the generators that I will use, they will be of the form 1, 1, 1, 1, either on the blue vertices or on the red vertices. So next generator, it will be. No, only these two code words. So this is like a product code. It has two code words. So the dimension of this thing is one, if you want. So on the blue vertices, I will put uh, X type generators. So what will be an X type generator, for instance, for this blue vertex? It will be X, 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 X. Okay, uh, this is really the idea of 
putting you know, this guy, 1111, around this vertex. Uh, and for a Z generator, I will put a Z generator around every red vertex, and I will put Z, 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 Z. Okay? So this is sparse. Okay, all my constraints, they have weight four. So this is like a sparse thing. The, the, the thing I need to check is whether or not, uh, you know, these things commute. So this, these two ones that I wrote, they, they commute, uh, obviously, because they act non-trivially on like non-overlapping sets of qubits. Uh, so when I say XXXXX, I just mean, you know, XXXX on these four qubits and identity everywhere else. Okay? But this looks just like the toric code. It is. It's like a deformed version. It's a rotated version of the toric code. Um, but it looks like it. Yeah, it is. It's a, like a... It's a rotary code in a different, uh, I present it slightly differently. The parameters are slightly different, um, but it fits the framework I want to, to, to study very well. Um, so these two things, they commute. Now you could ask, okay, so these two ones commute, but maybe this one, if I take the, the red one here, maybe they won't commute, but the red one is Z, 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 Z. So these two things will commute also because they, you know, they only commute only on two vertices. Uh, and you could say, okay, maybe this one and this one won't commute, but here you have x, 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 x. Uh, so what will happen is that for every generator like this, um, um, two generators of different type, x and z, that will you know, overlap on some set of qubits, they will overlap you know, on two qubits, so either on a column of this, of this matrix or on a row. Okay, and on this column and in this row, you know, um, you know, for the blue thing I see one one, and for the red thing I see one one also. So these two things are orthogonal; they commute. Um, and this is the toric code. Um, so this is a rotated toric code. So it, the the thing is a bit better than toric code. So it's, you know, if you really have that the number of qubits, so you need like a, to take like, okay, say. Uh, it has to be even, this thing, but so n equals, um, so the number of squares, so it's 4 L squared. Um, the dimension is 2, and the distance is really 2 L. So it's really square root n. Um, so this is the rotated Turing code. If you take the real, the, the standard one, uh, the distance is a bit less good. You, you lose a square square root two factor, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so this is the Turing code, this is surface code. Um, and so this afternoon, what I will try to show is how we go from this to a more general uh, code. So this, you know, this, this looks a lot now like the repetition code. No? You, at, each, at each vertex, you have something that looks just a product of two repetition codes. Uh, vertical and, and horizontal ones. Um, and, and okay, the repetition code is something, you know, local in 1D, okay, it goes through a circle. Here you have something local in, in 2D, because when you go quantum, somehow you need to square everything, so you go from 1D to 2D. Um, and really the codes I will mention this afternoon, uh, they, they start with this good expander code that we had yesterday, uh, and you apply the same recipe as here, um, so you need to say, okay, or you, you need to generalize the graph that we had, this, that we had okay, yesterday. So, so a, a grid like this with squares is good. So it's like the, what you get when you start with the repetition code, you get like something like this. Um, if you want something more general, you need a thing like this with also you know, vertices, edges, and squares, but that will look a bit more complicated than this object. But once you have this object that, you, that is easy to define, and you put, you know, uh, uh, code constraints on every vertex of this form, um, uh, of this form, C0 times C1, two classical codes, then you will get the good ellipse codes that we want. Okay, so that's the, the goal for, for this afternoon. Uh, I'm done for this morning. Okay. Thank you very much. Code, right? This is what you called yesterday the small. Code. This one is a small code, yes. Can you remind me? This is really silly.
why uh, the story code has two qubits rather than one or four? I don't know. <laughs> It is easy to see. Um, so you just you know, need to count how many things there are. So you have you know, n qubits. So you have 2L times 2L qubits, number of squares. Then you need to count how many uh, generators you have. OK, so this will be. And this, is, this is the computation you showed before. Which is yeah. Minus one. Yes. So, but if, so if you co count naively uh, the, the number of generators, you know, uh, you get one generator for each blue vertex. You get one generator for each red vertex. And if you count the number of vertices, it's also for L squared. You have as many vertices as squares. So naively, you would get zero. So, but it turns out that they are not. Yeah, there's a relation. If you, if you multiply all the generators, all the X generators together, you get the identity. Because everywhere, this, this qubit is involved in that one and that one. So you get one relation for each type of generators. And so you get two relations uh, in total. So you get two qubits. So you get one. Yeah. Yeah. So in order to generalize, to get better, you use the same small code but change the graph. So I change the graph, and I will not use this small code. I will use like a more, slightly more general one, a product code, C zero times C one. Where both C0 and C1, they are, you know, because like yesterday. So delta and rho delta and whatever, delta, delta. So, uh, so I need codes of length more than two. If it's length two, then somehow you cannot do anything. Uh, I need a distance here to be at least three, I guess. Yeah. And indeed, if I want to keep the graph and change the code, I will do that then we can do it. If you want to keep this graph, so, yes, to keep the graph and change the small code, or is there any information about what you have to do? But you mean this graph or the graph that I will use? So this graph, this graph, there are not many small codes that you can take. You know, you want a code, you want somehow a product code uh, that acts on four things. Um, and basically, this is the only non-trivial one that you get. So if you, if you, if you really start with the grid on the torus, you, there's not much besides the, the toric code that you can do. Um, so we need to find a way to have uh, something where, you know, what we need, we need to do is to increase the number of, uh, the degree of this, of this graph somehow. So it won't be planar anymore. It will be like a, like a mess. But, uh, yes, it's clear that you can improve the distance of the code if you are um, staying with the, with the grid. But the uh, um, one about the rate? Because you could uh, construct anyhow with uh, the grade uh, caused as a uh, scary distance, but possibly rate? So, so you can increase the grade by, as Robert mentioned this morning, so you can, you know, so draw. Increase by uh, of 0.1, I mean, uh, asymptotic, you get a linear dimension. So you can, okay, so you can do that, so you can have k order n. Uh, if you do that, the, the distance drops to log n. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, you can punch many, many, many holes in this thing. And, and I think it's, uh, for Reddit, it's, uh, lower we can. so uh, I'm not even sure it's log and maybe it's constant. Uh, I will bet my life on this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you cannot. So you, there's a trade-off that you can do. K. Yeah, I think maybe it's constant. Um, it's mentioned that uh, there is an equation. In, uh, yeah, you have k d squared. In two Ds, you have this, this yeah, relation. I think this law is uh, valid only when you consider codes that you uh, obtain by uh, venturing. By, uh, yeah. So, I mean, if there is other construction uh, that does not include uh, making all in your grid, uh, maybe is, this, is that still valid? Or, uh, this thing, so. Uh, so any time that I mean, you it's a geometrical property of, of the it's a, yeah yeah it's something yeah yeah it's topological property. So every time you have you can draw your code on a surface like a, on a two D surface, it can be uh, if it's in if it fits in Euclidean space. Uh, I think you have this relation. If the surface and uh, you can make it like in hyperbolic space, I guess you can get this log log n in hyperbolic space. Um, but it's really a property of, yeah, the, you have the, this manifold. It's a 2D manifold. And then you, you have this kind of bounds that come really from topological arguments. So if you increase the dimension, if you say, OK, I work in 3D or 4D, uh, you get slightly better things. But uh, 
if, you're, if you have bounded dimension, if you can embed the manifold in bounded dimensions, you can never get a good code. You can never get K and D both linear in M. 